If you are anything like me, you've always been drawn to the more shiny things in life. And some of those shiny things are different rocks, minerals, semi-precious gemstones. I've been known to be a little bit of a rock hound, someone who likes to collect and gather rocks everywhere I go, whether that be on the beach, in the desert, along the river bank. I'm always searching for the most interesting and unique different types of rocks. So when I found this Natural Geographic set, I knew that I wanted to share it with you guys, but share it ASMR style. So let's open it up, see what we get inside, and hopefully learn something new about different rocks. That goes over all of the different gemstones that we'll find inside. We have a little storage box. We have an itty bitty little tiny magnifying glass to get that extra close up angle as we are identifying each stone. As well as two separate bags. Containing our 15 specimens. So, I think the best plan of attack here is going to be laying out all of the gemstones on the table and then we'll go through the book and see if we can correctly identify them. We may have to use our magnifying glass when we feel a little bit unsure, but hopefully we won't have any difficulties trying to put a name to each of these rocks and learning something different about them. This seems to be a bag of polished gemstones or minerals. And then this one seems to be of the raw variety. But there is quite the collection and definitely a few that are catching my eye right away. Some of them I do already know the name of, so we will start by opening our book and flipping to the first page. Alright, I am going to call out a few that have caught my eye. The first one is going to be This pyrite. I know it is pyrite because it is one of my favorite gemstones. As I said, I am drawn to all things shiny and sparkly, but I also am familiar with a few other of these gemstones. We have Tiger's Eye, which is very easy to identify just based on the stripes that run up and down the stone as well as its kind of iridescent sheen. So let's see, make sure that we have all 15. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 
11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. There's these very large pictures of each of the gemstones, which will help us identify. And we are going to pull out the first one, which is pyrite, and set it just in the top here to the side as our officially identified. We have pyrite. The shiny yellow slash gold color of pyrite crystals often lead people to believe that they had found gold. And it's so nicknamed fool's gold. It comes from the Greek word for fire because it could create sparks when struck against steel. So I actually didn't know that about pyrite, that it does create sparks when struck against steel. But I was aware of it being known as fool's gold and can definitely see if you were digging around on a riverbed of something or something of the sorts and you sketch its glimmer out of the corner of your eye, how you would have that rush of emotion or rush of excitement thinking that you might have struck gold. Um, of course, I really love pyrite because of all of the small surfaces that form that really just catch the light and make it sparkle so beautifully. Next up, we have Desert Rose. So I actually use to live in a desert climate where you could find desert rose in the wild or in the desert um, and sometimes when you found them they were very large in size but always so interesting and so beautiful they have these really interesting ridges and almost looks like very thin sheets of minerals pressed together. So desert rose are some of my favorite as well. Easy peasy to right off the top, able to identify with no issues at all. We have the desert rose. When we hear the word crystal, most of us think of minerals form with angular shapes and sharp points, but sometimes crystals form in flat planes that stack on top of each other, making them appear flaky. Some minerals form lens-shaped crystal plates that stack in whorls, making them look like rose petals. Under very dry conditions, the mineral gypsum will form rosettes as well as barite, celestine, and a few others. Often, the crystals include small particles of desert sand, giving them a grainy texture. Okay, so that makes sense on why desert rose has that rough grainy texture. I makes complete sense. It's not an association that I had ever made when seeing them, that it was actually small bits of sand stuck to the minerals. Next up, we have quartz crystal. So quartz is very abundant. Um, I'm sure we'll learn a little bit more about it, but I will speak on my experience with quartz. Now we do have a couple that could potentially be quartz, just from my first impressions. We have a polished stone that could be quartz or could be a rose quartz because I am seeing a slight rose color to it, but it's not as strong as some of the other rose quartz I've seen in my life. We also have this one here, which has a very similar rose color, but is in the untumbled or raw form. We also have this guy here, as well as this one. So I'll show you them side by side. And you can see they are very similar, 
The one in my left hand does have almost like a green or sea glass color to it and that is leading me to believe that it is in fact not quartz, it might be something else. And then the one in my right hand, while it does look like quartz, it has a lot of really flat, sharp, angular sides to it. It doesn't have the point that a lot of us associate quartz with or raw quartz with where it forms a very sharp angular point, but that just might be due to the piece of quartz that we have. I am seeing a lot of reflective mirrored sides to it, and it is smooth along some of the edges which could lead me to believe that this one here is going to be our quartz. Let's read a little bit about it. We might get a clue in the write-up, but I will show you the picture because the picture very clearly demonstrates that sharp point that I'm talking about. And that's going to be That one there. So we have quartz crystals. Quartz is the second most abundant mineral on Earth's continental crust and is found in many varieties and colors. Amethyst, tiger's eye, and citrine are all types of quartz. No matter how distorted a quartz crystal may be, the long prism faces always make a perfect 60 degree angle. 17th century studies of quartz laid the groundwork for modern crystal crystal crystallography. Crystallography. I have a feeling there's going to be quite a few words that I stumble upon in these little write-ups, so please bear with me as we make our way through all of the different tongue twisters. But yes, okay, so the part that draws my attention is the long prism faces that always make the perfect 60 degree angle. Now, unfortunately I don't have a protractor close to me, but because this one does have a lot of flat, smooth pieces to it, I'm gonna believe that this one is our quartz. And compared to our other two, you can see the one in my right hand has a much more rosy color. And I have a feeling, because quartz is so abundant, they did give us both the rose quartz variety as well as just your standard run-of-the-mill quartz. So let's mark this one here as being our quartz. And we'll throw these two back in our pile and we will keep investigating. All right, so the next one we already have identified as being Tiger's Eye. Again, Tiger's Eye is very easy to identify just because of the stripe pattern and the luster that it gives off. So tiger's eye, a lustrous gemstone that is golden brown in color, occurs mainly in South Africa and soft in... <laughs> That's not even a hard word and I still fumbled it. From the top. Tiger's eye, a lustrous gemstone that is golden brown in color, occurs mainly in South Africa and East Asia. It is a member of the quartz family and has a hardness of 7.0 on the moss scale, about the same hardened, about the same hard and dead and dead and dead. That doesn't even sound like a real word. Like obviously it's a real word because it's in the National Geographic book, but please tell me, have you ever seen the word hard have both the E-N and E-D? I have not. But there it is. Hardened steel. Oh, it's just hardened. <sighs> is 
as hard as steel, okay? That's, that's the point we're trying to get here. Roman soldiers wore tiger's eye for protection in battle, and it's through, thought to have many mystical powers. I was curious. I was curious because, so for me, my first learnings of gemstones and semi-precious rocks came from a more spiritual approach. It is a special interest of mine um, to learn about different rocks and the properties that the spiritual community generally associates with them. I by no mean think that there are rocks from our planet that can solve all of your woes or hold magical powers, but I do believe that everything, big and small, does give off some form of energy or vibration, so it's, it's, it's kind of like a balance, I guess, of me saying, I think something that was formed millions of years ago could potentially hold properties or vibrations or energies, whatever you want to call it, that could be deemed mystical in nature. The reason I bring it up is because I was really curious how much of that National Geographic was going to go into in this learning guide. Were they going to give us a little bit of woo-woo, a little bit of spooky spooky, or were they going to keep it very scientific, very fact-driven? Um, but I think it is an important conversation to have when speaking about gemstones, that there are a lot of people in this world who very strongly um, associate different properties, feelings, energies, meanings, magicalness to um, a lot of the gemstones that we're going to be talking about today. Next. Okay, so next up we do have fluorite. At first glance, I'm not seeing any that are really jumping out to me. We do have this one here, which has definitely a green color to it. Should we get out the magnifying glass? So it definitely has a green color to it. It is slightly lustrous. It may have some mica properties in it because I do see it catch the light quite well. Um, but it's not nearly as vibrant or as saturated as the picture that they've given us. You can see right there. Those are very vibrant, very colorful, almost translucent. We do have this one, which has some translucent properties, but it's also quite lustrous. It's a little bit harder than this one here. This one feels rougher. It also feels softer. So maybe we'll read about fluorite and then we can decipher which one is the actual. So we have fluorite. Fluorite is a relatively soft mineral found throughout the world. Some samples of fluorite will glow under ultraviolet light, a property called fluorescence. Fluorite is used in many high-performance telescopes, microscopes, and camera lenses because it allows crisp images to be seen even at high magnifications and is usually light green or purple in color. It is light green in color, but not quite as translucent as I would expect fluorite to be, where this one is quite translucent, but not as green as I would expect fluorite to be. So maybe we'll put a pin in these two and further on in the book we'll be able to better identify which, which is which. 
All right, so we will leave those down there and we'll continue with the ones that we can easily identify and then just go through a process of elimination. So next we have hematite. Hematite is a mineral form of iron oxide that is typically steel gray in appearance. Before it's polished, it will often create a rust red streak when rubbed on another surface. It comes from the word it comes from the Greek word for blood, for it is blood-colored streak. Using an infrared spectrometer, NASA's Mars Global Surveyor collect located two deposits of hematite on the red planet. Okay, so this one is very easy to identify. It's going to be this little almost hockey puck looking gemstone. Um, it's definitely heavy, like it's much heavier than obviously our desert rose or even our pyrite. It feels very dense and hard. Um, it's also interesting how it has such flat, smooth, rounded edges where sometimes when a stone gets tumbled and polished, it kind of keeps it's rounded shapes, where this is quite flat on the sides, but still rounded and less, less like a cube, more like a hockey puck. So I'm not familiar with hematite, but it is very interesting that it is made up of iron. And the part that caught my attention the most is definitely the fact that it leaves a red streak before it's polished. But yeah, it feels, it feels very cool in the hand, for sure. Alright, let's set that one down. Ah, yes, the rose quartz. Unlike most varieties of quartz, this unusual pink stone only rarely displays well-formed crystals. Meteorologists do not completely understand the source of rose quartz highly prized pink color, but many believe it comes from iron, titanium, and magnesium impurities within the stone. So I also do know that rose quartz is often the stone of romance, of love, of affection, um, whether that be self-love or love for others. Uh, so that is kind of where it's generally associated with on a more spiritual plane. Now we have Snowfig Obsidian. So this one is also very easy to identify. Uh, just even though it doesn't look exactly like the picture, how they have it in the box, the really, really deep, dark, black bits the bits and bobs of the rock as well as the white pattering leads me to believe this is going to be our snowflake obsidian. I am not familiar with snowflake obsidian, but I do know obsidian does sometimes get a little bit of a bad rap. The regular type of obsidian is a volcanic glass formed when certain types of lava cool so rapidly that the crystals cannot form. When the lava cools more slowly, crystals can form and give the rocks a textured appearance. The crystals that speckle the surface of a snowflake obsidian are called sephirolites. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sephirolites, and they are formed and they form from the mineral cristobalite, a type of quartz. Sephirolites and cristobalite, all of the new words today. You can see in the picture, it is far more speckled in appearance, but it's interesting. So when obsidian cools very quickly, it has more of just like that pure black and then when it cools a little bit slower that's when you get the crystal ballite which is a type of quartz kind of mixed in with it and giving us our 
speckled appearance. As I'm looking at these gemstones and now that we've identified one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them already, so about half, I'm wondering if we did not get duplicates of some of them. Because if I had to make an assumption, I would assume this too is going to be our rose quartz. And then these two both look very similar, just in different tones. So we may have duplicates. Natural Geographic, did you give us duplicates? Is there supposed to be duplicates in our kit? <laughs> I guess there's only one way to find it. Okay, let's learn about some adventuring. Adventuring, one of the many varieties of quartz, usually occurs as a green stone, though some blue, gray, orange, or brown specimens can be found. Small flakes of mica, or hematite, can make adventuring sparkle and glisten, an effect called adventure's essence. Adventure essence. Now, let's just give a little flip back here. So, just a reminder, this one here is our hematite. So, small flecks of hematite, which is a form of iron oxide, is what gives adventuring. Small flakes of mica, or hematite, can make adventuring sparkle and glisten an effect called Adventure Essence. So I don't think either of the samples that we got. Now, sometimes you need to look directly in the sunlight to see the mica, but I don't think either of the samples that we got have any hematite in them. I think they are just pure adventuring. So let's put adventuring here and this one here because it may or may not also be adventuring. The next uh, stone that they have listed is Jasper. And now I am Canadian and Jasper is extremely common in Canada. Um, I'm not familiar if it's found all over the world or if it's more a North America localized deposit. They did show a picture of a red jasper as well. Um, we do have a red stone, but I'm not ready to immediately call it jasper even though it does have some of the marblings and specklings that we are have come to know as being Jasper. But let's read about it. I'm also interested to see if they make any sort of call out to where Jasper can be found. Jasper is a hard, opaque gemstone with a very special characteristics. A variety of Chalcedony, Chalcedony, Chalcedon, Chalcedony, a variety of Chalcedony. I need a phononic, phonetics, phononics. I need the phononics. I need it spelt out how it. I need it spelt how it sounds so I can say it correctly because I do not understand. Um, a type of quartz made up of microcrystals, jasper is very smooth and does not flake when cut. It can be polished into a high luster and is ideal for making jewelry, goblets, and other decorative objects. Could you imagine just having a goblet encrusted with semi-precious gemstones and it's just what you drink all of your fancy drinks out of? That is... that is... That is dreams right there. Um, which made it a favorite gemstone in ancient times. What makes jasper even more appealing, however, is the fact that other minerals, even organic material, can make up as much as 20% of a piece of jasper. In fact, the name jasper comes from a Greek word meaning spotted stone. Interesting, I didn't know that. 
Some ancient civilizations believed that Jasper could drive away evil spirits and protect against snake and spider bites. Several Native American or indigenous tribes throughout several um, tribes thought that it could bring rain. Today, many people wear or carry Jasper to bring about tranquility, alleviate stress, and reduce negative energy. Yes, Natural Geograph, National Geographic. I'm really surprised that um, National Geographic included characteristics such as tranquility, alleviating stress, and reducing negative energy in their write-up because they had the opportunity, definitely with rose quartz and obsidian and really all tiger's eye to talk more about the spiritual properties of them, but they waited until page four and page five to really bring that in. And I do believe that both of these are going to be our Jasper because in this red one, we are seeing a lot of different bands of color and specks and that organic matter that can make up Jasper. So here we are with National Geographic just getting a little bit witchy, getting a little bit woo woo. Oh, that makes me so excited. That makes me so excited. Okay, so we do have two stones left to identify. Um, I'm going to start with the stone that is going to be the easiest to identify. And that is going to be our pumice. Pumice is a very common in a lot of people's everyday life. If you've ever used a pumice stone for exfoliation, uh, it has almost a rough texture. It reminds me of the texture of when a cat licks you, like a cat's tongue against your skin. It's just like a little bit prickly and a little bit rough, but it's very light and I believe it's found... It's quite common, I believe, but I may be mistaken. So let's read about it and see if it mentions it. Pumice is a very unusual, ingenious rock that is typically light-colored because it contains a high percentage of silica. It is formed when superheated lava cools very rapidly and the gases inside cannot easily escape the lava. This process traps bubbles of carbon dioxide inside the pumice, making it one of the planet's lightest rocks. Cool science fact. Pumice is so light that it floats on water. Try it with the pumice in this kit. Well, I don't have a cup of water, but I do believe you. I do believe you. That's really interesting that the reason it's so light is not only because it has a ton of little holes inside of it, but there's actually carbon dioxide trapped in there, making it be able to float on water. That is so cool. Okay, going back to our very last identification. So now that I see the picture in the book for calcite, I do believe we are able to not only identify the calcite, but through the process of elimination, also identify our fluorite. So this one, I would say, would be our fluorite. And then this one here is going to be our calcite. So this one has a quite iridescent surface to it, as well as it has some sharp, smooth edges to it, and is quite translucent in the light as well. So we have calcite. Calcite is a common 
constituent of limestone and is one of the main minerals found in the shells of marine organi organisms like oysters. Single calcite crystals have a unique optical property called double refraction. Images seen through the crystal images seen through the clear crystal appears doubled. Ancient trilobites used calcite crystals in the lenses of their compound eyes. Calcite dissolves in most acids and will even slowly dissolve in water, but unlike most soluble minerals, calcite becomes less soluble as the water temperature increases. Interesting, so it's more likely to dissolve in a colder temperature water than it is in a warmer temperature, but I can definitely see if you had a very, very thin piece of calcite, how you would be able to see through it and how it would re refract different images or doubled images. And then the iridescence does definitely remind me of a oyster's shell. So very cool. And then that's the end. That is the end of our natural National Geographic Rock and Mineral Learning Guide. That was a lot of fun. Now, I do have a very large collection myself, and I would love to do another video where we go over my personal collection and talk about some of the spiritual associations that some of those gemstones and rocks have. So if that is something that you're interested in, please leave a comment below because I would love to make that video for you. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I hope you enjoyed learning about the different shiny, sparkly things. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.